Okay, hello everyone and welcome to another episode of The Bold Biomen. So today I'm super excited because not only do I have red hair, but, <laughs> and because if you've been around and you see the iterations of, of hair changes here, but I do have my colleague, Chris Fisher, um, who is going to be sharing his path from PhD or academia to scientific communications. We both work at CG Life, which is the company that I currently work at. I've been working there since uh, January 5th this year, and it's been fantastic so far. And Chris is an amazing colleague. And so I asked him if he would love to uh, talk to us about how he went, he made that transition, because I know that that's the most difficult part of all of this, is going from, you know, your research and everything that you've done and, you know, kind of making a 360 into something else where, yes, you're going to be using your degree. You're going to be using your degree for sure, because we definitely use our degrees in this job. Um, but also, um, you know, how, how to navigate that. So welcome, Chris. Thanks, G. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is really exciting. Um, I've wanted to do this for a little while, so I'm glad that we're uh, actually able to do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm excited that we made the time for it today. So like I was saying earlier on, you went from being a PhD, finishing your research, um, and then moving into scientific and medical writing. How did all of that happen for you? And maybe you can take us back to like your PhD and then how you sure. Yeah, you know, it's funny. For me, it kind of started even earlier. Uh, I just didn't realize it. Uh, so when I was an undergrad, I went to Boston University. Um, I, my degree was in biochemistry and molecular bio. Uh, I loved doing the science. I loved being in the lab. I wanted to do absolutely everything I could possibly do to be sort of connected to the science. Um, but also, while I was there, I also sort of developed a, a love for writing and just really for communicating and interacting with other people. At the time, I didn't really see them as, as being things that I could kind of bring together, or maybe I had a loose idea that, oh, maybe at some point this is, you know, this will, I'll, I'll use this English training uh, to benefit my scientific career in some way, shape, or form. Um, it wasn't really until grad school that, um, the, you know, the career that, that really that I have now and that I can enjoy currently um, kind of took shape. And a lot of that had to do with me just really exploring opportunities. Um, I, I really still enjoyed the research um, at the time. So I, I, my PhD was in chemical biology and, and I was studying how carbohydrates mediate uh, host pathogen interactions. And it turns out that that's basically true of every pathogen. And, you know, I absolutely love doing that research and, and being able to, to dig deeper on that point. But telling the story actually what was, was what like really got me up in the morning. In addition, I, I you know, I, I would say a couple times a week, I would spend an hour or two, maybe a little longer at a local coffee shop, uh, reading papers and, and occasionally people would kind of come through that friends of mine, and I would just kind of talk with them about what I was reading. And, and really those initial conversations uh, <laughs> made me realize that as much as I liked bench science, I actually liked the, the reading, the writing uh, and the speaking more. Uh, so with that, you know, I started to kind of develop that. Um, I took really as many writing opportunities as I could. And for me, a lot of that actually ended up being science advocacy. So I, I did a lot of um, advocacy at the local, state, and federal level with a couple of different student organizations, mostly advocating for research funding and, and issues related to students. But that writing practice, um, even though it was largely for members of the public or decision makers, I guess, not scientists, uh, made me realize that, yeah, I like just sitting down and thinking through and writing something. And... Um, I think it's from, I think it's from uh, a fame, I can't remember exactly, but a famous uh, writing book about um, what, you know, what writing is, and it's really good thinking, and, and that's how I see it as well, and, and what kind of crystallized for me in grad school. Hmm. This is, this is amazing. So you, you talked about the fact that you took advantage of several opportunities to you in grad school. What are some of those opportunities? Yeah. Because definitely, like, I'm thinking, as you were saying that, I was thinking what opportunities were there for me? And yeah. I'm sure there were, but I didn't seek them out. Um, but what kind of opportunities were there? And for people who are currently maybe uh, thinking about entering a PhD or already in a PhD, who might be thinking, ooh, I don't want to be in academia. Like, where could they look yeah. for these resources? 
Yeah, that's a, a really great question. A lot of it depends, obviously, on where you are in your university, as well as with what opportunities are kind of around you. But but for me, it came from a couple of different places. One, um, I was really in, heavily involved in a couple of training programs, one of which was funding me, one of which wasn't. Um, you know, it's kind of a weird thing. Like, you know, people, I think, sometimes look down on like, oh, why would you do a training grant? if you're not getting supported by it. And even, in fact, even my uh, PI was asking me that question. Um, but it was because of the opportunity. It was because there were chances to, to really start to develop some skills that I wasn't developing as part of my academic career, uh, or not as much at least. You know, so some of that was you know, traditional academic stuff that's, hey, we're having a quick talk competition, or hey, we're having a poster presentation. You know, and I, it would be optional, but I would just do it. Um, and then it also went to, you know, organizing those kinds of events and, um, you know, being a part of journal clubs and, and those kinds of things, even though that some, a lot of that is still traditional academia, it, it's, I would say, um, closer to the skill sets that, you know, that we use professionally. And it, it's, a, it's getting comfortable in front of an audience. It's learning how to talk uh, both in, in a prepared sense and then off the cuff as well. So, um, that was one place. Um, another certainly uh, was was coming from the, as I said, the advocacy groups that I was a part of. Uh, so, and that that really was a you know really important to me, especially while I was in grad school. That um, there's a uh, was a graduate student organization on campus, um, and they had peripheral affiliations with other uh, groups, some of which are restricted to UC. So I went to UC San Diego. Um, others were collaborations between other universities. And those were some of the, the opportunities that really kind of got me um, at least outside of the traditional academic route of, of you know, writing and talking about science. Mm -hmm. So those were, I would say, uh, chiefly important. Um, I also started uh, and founded um, an, or, an advocacy group within uh, the chemistry department on, on our campus. And that was really good practice for learning how to like work with others and manage and get things done in a collaborative way that wasn't just me like, zoning in on one research problem or trying to answer a question by myself, you know. So um, beyond that, I'm trying to think of other opportunities. You know, some of it was just my friends asking for me to explain the work uh, to them in, in a casual sense. Even even that, as simple as it is, like taking that opportunity to, to, to you know, try to re-energize yourself and tell the same story you've been telling, but in a way that somebody outside of science can appreciate is I think it is good practice and I a lot of grad students that I completely get it like you're burnt out people ask you how your research is going and that's like your least favorite question because uh, usually uh, it kind of sucks or at least it's been a, a you know a challenge yeah. um, but but getting you know just being comfortable with talking through why it's a challenge and you know accepting that I think is is, is really really good practice um, yeah, and then otherwise, I would say conferences, um, certainly. That was another, and, and professional organizations. So, uh, for example, um, I, you know, I've been a, a member of AAAS for a long time, um, and they run really fabulous national meetings that, that cover, you know, a diverse group of science. And they also have associations within them, both like subgroups and committees uh, that are focused on these these types of things, the whole sessions that are related to science communication and and um, scientific writing. Those are great opportunities. There's also the National Association for Science Writers, or NASW, um, and they have a local chapter in San Diego as well, as well as in other major cities. Um, and I, I remember I actually, one of the, I would say, big career steps I took was actually attending one of their internship fairs. And I showed up, like, not expecting to get an internship. A lot of people do, right? They, they, they go and they're um, they're there to like get one of the few spots. And I, I really just took it as an opportunity to practice doing interviews uh, and to, to just try to, um, you know, articulate what I've done and what I, what I believe I could do in this field. And um, even just answering their questions or, or um, understanding what they were looking for was really helpful for me to be like, oh, okay, well, I, I haven't done that. Like, so I need to go back to the drawing board and I need to add that to the list, of, the long list of things to do. And and continue to develop my skills. So I, yeah, I would say professional organizations, conferences, um, there is definitely a tendency in academia to, I, well, I would say, at least from my experience, not go to conferences unless you're presenting. Uh, unless there, there's, oh, I'm gonna give a poster talk or I got a 30 minute slot at American Chemical Society, whatever. And, and you know, there's some truth to that, it's expensive, but you know, it's good to just go to conferences and to, like learn. Um, you don't necessarily have to me have an objective beyond that. 
Um, so I would say that definitely a lot of opportunities for me came through doing that and, and taking those chances. This is, this is fantastic. You said so much and there's so much to unpack in there, right? I think the, <laughs> the biggest takeaway from what all you just said is don't be afraid to explore opportunities. Don't be afraid to be part of organizations. Don't be afraid to, you know, because you went to the, the internship uh, thing and then you were not really looking for an internship, but you were looking for an opportunity to interview, right? And I think for a lot of you know, I'm thinking about myself and when I was a PhD, I would not have done that because I'd be like, that's such a waste of my time. Like, why wouldn't I uh, uh, spend the afternoon, you know, giving my mice something instead of doing that, right. right? Right, but I really do think that you raised some really, really good points about take advantage of the fact that you're in a PhD program to, to, to experience a lot. To, and, and like I was saying earlier on, I didn't seek out the opportunities, but in hindsight, I see, oh, there might have been opportunities. Even when I was doing my postdoc at UC San Diego, there were opportunities to um, take classes at, for instance, UCSD, which is UC San Diego has an extension. And you could take science writing classes there. Or you could take a mini MBA course. There were, there were things like that. And so I really love that Chris brought this up and he, he made it practical with, with what he was describing, that he sought out these opportunities. And I'm just going to, you know, it's, it's, I think that's a big takeaway from this, this episode is look, look for opportunities. It, when you're on a university campus, there is no shortage of opportunities to learn and be part and experience and be part of different uh, kind of communities and organizations. So my next question yeah. to you, Chris. Yeah, go ahead. Well, actually, sorry, before, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I completely agree with everything you just said. Um, yeah, just to reiterate, um, as much as there's like a fear of, I don't know, putting yourself out on a limb, do it as much as possible. I mean, like worst case scenario, you're unqualified. Like, whatever, well, you know, like, life's too short to be worried about what people all the time think about what you've done. And most people are interested in helping you if you're interested in helping yourself. So even if it doesn't land you, in, you know, in my case, an, in, an internship, or you don't necessarily know, like, what you're going to do with, with that experience, just putting yourself on the limb is, is worthwhile. And, and, and to be fair to you, G, you know, you said, like, you know, I didn't always, like, seek out those opportunities. It's my perspective that a lot of academic institutions are not that great about functionally endorsing these kinds of things. Yeah, but, you know, there, there's a lot of um, communication, maybe from administration, from dean, the dean level that says, hey, we have a career development opportunity or, hey, there's a professional development um, and career center on campus. You should check it out. Um, but, you know, in academics, especially, I would say in STEM PhDs, those people don't really have very much um, effect ultimately on what you're doing. The people that do are your your lab mates and, and largely your advisor. So mm -hmm. if your advisor is not encouraging you to do those things, it can be it can feel really hard to actually yeah. do them. Uh, my advice is to just do what you need to do and take a chance. Absolutely, absolutely. I really I really appreciate that you said that. And and the reality because an academic is trying to make you an academic, right? They, they're, they're professional academic, they wanna make you an academic. So most of the time there really isn't any incentive to tell you to go for these career. And actually, if you're watching this video or if you happen to listen to this as a podcast, leave me a comment or tweet at me and let me know, like, did you have actual career days in your PhD? I know it sounds so juvenile, like career days, that's from high school, but no, I'm meeting more and more PhDs that I feel like maybe we should have these opportunities um, and, and, and grad school. Some people didn't even know that apart from teaching at a university, they could do way more than, they, than that with their PhDs, you know? And I, at least I didn't know it until my third or fourth year of grad school. And that was pretty far along in my, in my journey. So, okay, so mm -hmm. I, I, the question I was gonna ask you earlier was, you obviously had this rich background of experiences and all that. How did you translate that? How did you take all of that experience? And then once you were out of school, translate that into, or how did you even craft your resume using that? I, I think I'm, I'm just thinking about the, what your mindset was in, in taking those skills and then applying it to, or applying for this position. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, <laughs> it's, you know, it is really hard. And a lot of it is difficult for the fact of knowing what's important to others and knowing what, what, what you've done is, is valuable. And, and again, um, you know, as much as I love academic research and I, I love academic institutions, I, I don't know that they do a great job of coaching you to, to feel good about what you've done. Uh, you know, yes, obviously, if you're publishing, yes, if you, you get a big postdoc, and yes, obviously, if you become a professor, that's strongly encouraged. But, but some of the other, you know, very valid career paths are not always rewarded in the same way. So um, in terms of knowing what was valuable, I, it actually took me quite a bit of time to, I would say, separate from, <laughs> from the academic mindset and think about the skills that I acquired. And, and that's really where it started for me was, um, you know, I had been collecting a CV in my entire time. I, I'm thoroughly organized, maybe to a fault. And I had been like compiling a list of all the things that I had done, sort of big and small. Right. So maybe that like founding that organization I mentioned, like that, obviously that's a big thing. That was something I worked on for multiple years. But also, hey, I attended this very small conference and I didn't <laughs> I didn't even speak at it, but simply like just taking notes and, and sort of, you know, what workshops I attended within that. Um, so just kind of keeping a running list, I think is helpful so that it reminds you all of the little things that you've done. And it gives you that confidence that, oh, wait, like I I, I do have this skill. Um, and it helps to kind of push back that imposter syndrome that I would say basically everybody in science faces. So, um, and then, the, you know, as you were saying, the key part is refining that into a resume. And then I would say even more importantly, into a cover letter. And that was actually one of the first things I did after I finished grad school. And not just because I needed a job, but because um, I, I, I felt a little, not lost, but um, confused about, you know, where I'm headed. Um, and, and for the reason that you described that so much of academia is coaching you to be academic. And yet, you know, less than 10% of, of all uh, PhD graduates will go on to be academics. So um, that like exercise of putting together a resume and thinking about the skills that I had acquired um, was really, really helpful. And again, writing that cover letter and saying like, who am I? You know, what, what is it that I want to accomplish? And that's a really hard question, especially if you have a lot of diverse interests, which I think a lot of academics do. They're interested naturally by the world around them. Uh, so just trying to refine that to, if I had to be doing one thing or, or a, a couple of things, you know, what is it? And it doesn't have to be, you know, writing for a scientific journal about X. It can be simply like talking to people. Um, who, like what audience? Um, and, and to what extent, uh, what kind of change, are you looking to affect change or are you looking to educate an audience? Are you looking to influence the decision-making of decision makers? Those kinds of questions I think are really helpful for getting at the root of where you feel most happy and engaged. Um, no more tunnel vision. <laughs> like, oh yes, uh, how do silic acid bearing glycans impact the influenza virus? That's my dissertation. It's like, no, like, like, let's think a little bigger. Like, let's think about you as a person and not just you as your, a researcher. Um, so yeah, that was it for me. I think the big, first big exercise was just trying to write, you know, a, a cover letter, cover letter um, page that could more or less general, generalize what I was interested in. And the resume activity is kind of similar, um, I would say. Absolutely. Oh, so good. I love, I love what you just said, right? Because I think this is exactly why so many PhDs end up struggling career-wise. Not that we don't, we're not intelligent enough or we couldn't apply our skills everywhere. Because the nature of research is so reductionist, so many of us are so tunnel visioned when it comes to careers. I, I don't know. I, at least I know that yeah. that way, but, but that it's good, especially in the bio, I guess in the biological sciences and in the sciences in general, most work is now very, very reductionist. And so you're looking at things like a tiny part of a pathway in a, in, a, in one specific type of cell. Right. And so you're looking at something that's like one millionth of a chance of happening and your whole world is that, right? For your whole PhD, that you forget that yep. there's, hey, wait, 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 we have to like come up from the reductionist approach and then expand things and it's, and look at everything like holistically, you know? So Absolutely. 
I, I love, I love that you said that, that look at you as a PhD, not just your research. Like, yes, you got a PhD in chemistry or you got a PhD in biomedical science or whatever, but that's not the only thing about you. There's so much, you're, you're, so, right. you're such a multifaceted human and, and all of those facets can fit into some profession somewhere, you know, <laughs> so I, I love, I love that you said that. Okay. So, yeah. I, so okay. I'm sorry. One thing I just wanted to add there is, yeah. um, yeah, I mean, of course, like it's important to an extent for research to be laser focused. So there's a value to that, but you have to be able to, to tread the boundary and go back and forth between what you're focused on and where you are in the big picture of things. And, and actually historically, Funny enough, you know, the earliest scientists in the early modern period, which is about the 16th century, that's how they saw science or at the time natural philosophy, which was, it wasn't just, oh, I have this thing I'm re like really interested and focused on, but it was also, how does that fit into the big picture? And, and those, those first academics, you could call them, were really the people that were, they were talking to everybody. And that's not just like, um, you know, the, well, I mean, I guess there weren't really chemists at that point in an official sense, but th the naturalists weren't just talking to people that were, you know, close to them in terms of what was interesting. They were also talking to people that were more literary inclined or more, or, or were actors, were focused on, you know, general philosophy, focused on mathematics. They, they had a diverse appetite for, for what they were doing, even though they were also focused on one thing. And, and I do feel like that the sciences sometimes, we, we, we focus, uh, I would say, on discovering something new somewhat in a vacuum, or at least that's, that happens more often than it should. And, and take, being able to step back and say, where does this fit in? And also, who am I talking to that's not just you know, my immediate field? Like, who else could benefit from this information has, has a lot of value. So that was a, a long aside that I, <laughs> no, I, I wanted to get away. I think it's a great answer. And I think, I think I'm beginning to see a, a little bit more of that because honestly, when I was also entering into science, that's what I actually thought science was. I thought it was, you know, it was Mendel Mendelian genetics where he was just looking at pea plants and, and, you know, the different colors that will come up from, you know, he was looking at something that was so, he could explain to a crowd, right? But if you're looking at a, a, a protein and a pathway in a specific cell, that can become very detached very easily um, when yep. you're just looking at it from that approach. And I don't, you know, I think that the thing that we're both saying here is, don't allow that 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 way of thinking of science to affect your career because it, it exactly. has the ability to do that absolutely i love it so um shifting gears just a little bit into your current career as a science writer editor amazing communicator what does a typical day like this is not even a question because a typical day is always different but what can if somebody wanted to come into into this right mm -hmm. from where you we are right now and and just for context we work with a life and health sciences marketing agency um so think about your big life health sciences companies we we um we help them with their marketing right and we are scientific writers on on the team so um, what does a typical day look like, Chris? <laughs> yeah, uh, that's well. I, I would say what's interesting about agency life and working in you know communications and marketing is, is you know you're really not dealing with one problem at a time. You're mm -hmm. juggling several different clients, several different projects. Depending on how focused your agency is, it can be you know really narrowed to a subset of a subset of fields, or it could be broad, you know, and I would say CG life is, is relatively broad across, as you said, the life sciences and, and healthcare spaces. Um, so a typical day for me, I would say some of it is, is just juggling that and just starting it off. I always just, just want to round out like everything that's sort of up in the air, you know, like what are the projects that are ongoing? You know, where are they at individually? Um, what are the more immediate deadlines and then the long-term deadlines? Mm -hmm. and, and that process is really, I, for me personally, that's the only way I can kind of manage all of those, those diverse projects and challenges is I just have to like have almost a running inventory of it. So that, that's definitely step one for me. Well, okay, I take that back. Step, step one is uh, consume an absolute ton of caffeine because I'm a complete addict. And then step two is, uh, is ultimately uh, uh, compiling the list. Um, yeah, so then I would say the rest of the day is, is some combination of actually, you know, formally doing writing, 
um, you know, obviously that's a big chunk of the work that we do. So at this point, you know, we have an idea, we have a structure to the piece and we're just sort of um, putting together the story, the narrative, and, and obviously sourcing the, the background information as we need it. So that's, I would say, a big chunk of my day. I would say depends on where exactly all the projects are at, but at least between, you know, 20 and 60% of the day, I would say. Um, obviously, but the rest of that, so, um, you know, in my role at the agency as a, a content strategist, you know, part of what that also means is that I am helping to kind of formulate, you know, what the content will be. Um, and figure out what the strategy is going to be for distributing that. So that's another big part of it, I would say, is maybe another, you know, 10 to 20 percent is, um, you know, brainstorming content ideas and justifying, um, justifying them. So that's who's the audience, right? how is this beneficial to the, the overall story, how does this communicate some piece of science that's important to these organizations, um, and then ultimately, how are we going to, as I said, how are we going to reach people? Are we going to try to pitch this in, in terms of public relations? Are we going to try to put this on the site and optimize it for search engines? Um, are we going to do paid advertising of some uh, variety? And, and really, part of my work is, is helping to decide, like, what makes the most sense? Usually, the answer is a bit of everything. It depends, uh, you know, sort of balancing it, depending on your, what budget you have, what time you have. But, um, but that's definitely another big part. Um, additionally, and I, I'm sure that you, you also play this role a lot, um, part of it is just being uh, an educator uh, and being able to kind of quickly provide useful synopses that are not, um, you know, that don't like overly simplify the science, right? The, the challenge that, that I think we have is, of course, there are a lot of scientists that work at our agency and work at agencies like ours. But we're also working with a lot of people that have other skill sets, right? These might be artists, creative folks, people that are, um, you know, that, that are practiced in, in making these beautiful figures, designing web pages, um, you know, providing uh, imagery support for, for content. All of that is incredibly important to getting the, the content out. Um, but they don't necessarily have a great appreciation all the time of all of the science, nor should they. Um, you know, they learn it over time, but, but helping, you know, connect them and provide them with resources. And even if it's just a two minute, hey, what does this mean? Um, being able to kind of quickly explain that again without, you know, oversimplifying it or, um, you know, providing, making sort of inaccuracies by omission. Um, and it's a challenge, certainly, but as scientific communicators, I think that is really the, our main focus. It's, you know, how do you communicate science across boundaries from the experts, the scientists themselves, the doctors, the clinicians, um, through, you know, the very, uh, I would say, or, or less connected public, you know, the public that doesn't know a scientist, um, and being able to, to have an explanation across that spectrum that isn't, um, you know, admitting critical information or isn't inaccurate for the sake of simplicity is is the challenge and it, it's it's not it's, it's rarely perfect but um but that's what i think i spent a lot of time thinking about is you know how to if i can say this in 2000 words great you know if i can say this with you know at a high technical level with 40 references great uh what about if it's a social media post right like how do you get something out that is valuable uh, that is 250 characters. Um, so that that I would that juggling I think is um, and, and helping to educate others so that they can do their work is is maybe the rest of it. Um, and that's, frankly, that's some of the part that I like the most, just because as I said, I, I like talking to people and I like um, having the opportunity to um, tackle you know a, a complex bit of science and try to bring it and uh, consolidate it and make it more manageable to to somebody else. Absolutely. I, and I think that that last point you made there is one of the reasons I was attracted to scientific communication and is, is a natural strength for me. It's like, okay, let's take this complex idea. Let's break it down and make it simple. I, I don't know if I always do a great job of that, but I love that, right? It's take a complex idea, make it simple enough so that whoever is reading, because with, with marketing, with what we do, um, we may be writing from anywhere we may be writing for like a group of PhDs and MDs, or we could be writing for, you know, a regular person who has nothing to do with life sciences and healthcare, knows nothing, but still we have to communicate information to them in a correct way, in a, in a sensible way, uh, and in a way that is simple enough that it doesn't dilute the science. So love, love, love that. Right, right. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, that's exactly right. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think one question that I'm going to ask before, well, there are two more questions I have. One question is for somebody who wants to get into scientific writing, what should they be doing right now? Uh, well, writing is a good start. Uh, <laughs> even if it's just for your own sake, right. uh, you know, and I think that that's, there's a, a lot of people have a lot of anxiety about writing. Um, mm. and that, that goes for people, scientists that goes for, you know, accountants that goes for everybody that there's this like fear or, or, or frustration with writing. Um, how you get through that is just by doing it. Um, and, and it doesn't have to always be for somebody else, but simply just getting in the habit of, of sitting down for even just a couple of hours at a time, maybe an hour, and just getting some thoughts into into page and, you know, and, and really try to make things, your written thoughts um, clear, I think is really, really good and important practice. And it builds confidence. And, and eventually, if you do enough of that, even if it's just brainstorming, even if it's just sort of off the cuff, that, will, that can turn into stories, right? That can turn into something that you can maybe maybe it's an essay, you know, maybe it's a, a sort of a personal reflection on something in science that, that is interesting to you. Maybe it's not, maybe it's, oh, you're, you know, you're really close to this, this interesting bit of science and you realize that the public isn't plugged into it. So maybe you want to like develop it into, you know, a short uh, piece for a journal, you know, for um, a scientific journal or, a, you know, a, a pop sci journal. Um, and, and learning how to, to pitch, I think, is another really good option there. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm, cert I'm not a science journalist. Uh, I certainly have a lot of friends that are. Um, I've done some freelance writing, but, like, pitches are, it's, a, it's an art. Um, how do you include enough information to interest them without providing uh, too little? Um, and I would say that the way you get better at it is just by doing it um, and just um, meeting some editors and, and, and this, again, it can be from journals, it can be from places that are publishing essays. Um, obviously, Medium is another really great source. Um, a, a lot of people use Medium as a chance to get some stuff out, but it's still fairly personal, right? It's not, um, it's not like you're, it's going to go, people may not necessarily see it, but it is public, it's available. Um, so I would say just, again, just writing is, is a great place to start. And as part of that, I would also say, you know, even if you don't necessarily want people to read what you're writing, uh, that's maybe step two, which is find somebody that you trust, that you value, that, you know, somebody that has a good view on, on the audience that you theoretically want to be speaking to, and just let them read your stuff. And, and it doesn't have to be the line editing of put a comma here, you know, whatever, cut this sentence. It, it can simply be does this make sense? What were your impressions? And just having those conversations helps you to align it, which is another big challenge in writing in general, which is, does, is, is the way that I'm thinking about it clear to the reader? There's always this divide between your perception and the reader's perception. And that's the part of the challenge of writing clearly is, 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 bringing those two as close together as possible. And then to some extent, it'll never be perfect. The reader has other things that they've learned that they're interested in, and it's going to orient how they think about your writing. But um, it's good practice to start learning how you're being perceived, and that helps you have more control over that process. So start with, you know, having a friend, a, you know, a, maybe your advisor, maybe a postdoc, uh, read through some of what you've written and just give you some, you know, off the cuff response to it, have coffee with them, chat it out. Um, and then maybe, as I said, then at that point, work on assembling some of that into something that's, that's worth pitching. Um, I would say additionally, there are a lot of the professional organizations um, are eager to have people help them write things as well. Um, especially, you know, if you're a graduate student, you are, even though you don't feel like it, like as far as the the general audiences are concerned, especially for your topic, you are already an expert. Like, yes, you don't have your PhD yet, but you like, <laughs> how many other people have read hundreds of papers on, I don't know, yeah. epigenetics or, you know, like <laughs> the average person doesn't read one. So, you know, you, you know a lot and science is so, the fields are so distributed that even an expert scientist, a biophysicist doesn't have, doesn't know everything, right? So you might still be an expert compared to them um, as long as, you know, you're within your subfield. So these professional organizations, they often are looking for some writers to support things like newsletters, 
um, you know, maybe brief articles that go out in their sort of monthly magazines or in their emails that are kind of separate from, uh, you know, separate from their actual publications. So that's often a good chance. Of course, like I would, I'll always say that you, <laughs> you don't necessarily want to do a lot of free work. Uh, if it's something that's interesting to you, do it. Uh, if, if it's something that will give you experience, do it. Uh, but, but don't do it forever. Uh, and, and just remember that ultimately, once you've had enough practice, uh, you, you're valuable even if you don't necessarily feel it. But those opportunities are nice. It just gives you a chance to do something low stakes, um, get something out there, you know, start building the portfolio. And, and maybe that's the, the next step is um, have a portfolio of some kind. Um, it can include your academic work. It can include your favorite paragraph from a review that you wrote, you know, or maybe even from something that never ended up getting published. Um, you, you know, your portfolio doesn't have to be so sophisticated, especially when you start off, but just kind of building it and giving people samples of what you can do is, is helpful. So I guess maybe the, those are the, the, the four main steps I would say is, is just kind of get going. Yeah, get going. I agree. And, and you know, um, just to chip this in here, um, when I started writing, I was not writing about science. I was just blogging. I was blogging about all these experiences <laughs> I was having. Yeah. You know, um, even when I started blogging, it was nothing to do with marketing or anything, you know? Yep. So you can absolutely get started writing. All of that does count. I really like your idea of seeking out opportunities in, you know, professional organizations like the NSAW, um, the National Association of Science Writers, or there's another one called the American Medical, I think, Writers Association, right? There are always opportunities for, um, for elected officials and stuff like that, and, and they, need, um, they need help because they're an organization. Yep. They don't always have all the money to run, and so if they get some help, it's helpful to them. Um, so all these are opportunities to seek out, and um, thank you so much for bringing that up, Chris. So my last, yeah. question, my last question, I guess, for you is, um, what made you dissatisfied with academia? <laughs> uh, okay, I, yeah, I, I, I love this question. Um, you know, it, it's a couple things, actually. Um, and, and I want to be clear that I, in a weird way, I love academia. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I will always appreciate, um, the, you know, the role of um, academic science and how fun it can be you know, when it's done, when it's done properly and, and when um, it's sort of organized in a sensible way. My frustration with academia is largely that it's not very self-correcting um, as for, for science, which is a progressive philosophy, right? Okay, we have, here is our current interpretation of reality. And that's based on evidence that we're collecting independently and we can agree that this is as um, you know as I like to say it's evidence of a shared reality so doing that and, and I think kind of getting in the exercise of building that information means that you have to accept the fact that some of what you perceive as reality is wrong you know we just don't have a complete understanding yet mm -hmm. so what do you do in science you publish a new paper you collect new data you adjust the consensus you challenge the consensus and maybe there's contention at there at, at points where oh well i don't agree with that and i think this experiment is flawed it's like well but yeah but you're ignoring this detail and it's clear you know that's all part of the process but the point is that science is in theory at least self-correcting and I, and i would say from my experience academia tends to be a little bit more insulated um, both from the public and in and also from industry as well and from other areas of, of life and as a result what happens is it, I, I think at least it can get to a point where um, it, it's so much about accomplishment and not enough about sort of the process right it, it to me at its core when academia is at its best everyone is there for the journey and not the destination but I, I think what ends up happening because of how there's so many pressures on, on professors and universities to collect grants and publications and recognition, that it, it ends up kind of distracting from the initial goal, which is producing the next generation of thinkers. And we get so focused on accomplishment that we forget that accomplishment is supposed to represent 
what we have learned, not be a stand-in for it. And, and as I said, I think academia, even though there's a lot of recognition, a lot of people get that, a lot of graduate students, postdocs, professors see these, these sort of systemic problems, it's so difficult to change. And as, as I said, that's so, I, find, I found that very funny and frustrating because science is not supposed to be like that. And it's, it's weird that um, we, we wouldn't, we'd never make the excuse in, in a paper that, oh, you know, that's too hard to fix or that's too big a problem. It's never going to change. That's never acceptable in science. It's always, uh, it's fluid, right? Things can change as we get more information, technology advances. Mm -hmm. But in, in academics, at least my experience was that, you know, talking about this, about how you can make the educational process better, how you could take away some focus away from sort of traditional academic um, value propositions like publishing and, and, uh, and grant collection to focus on other details like educating the public, engaging policymakers, those kinds of things. So that, that's, I would say, the big thing for me is I, I wish that academia in a more broad sense was willing to em embrace um, different lines of thinking and be more responsive to the the, the body of, of people that are there to learn. Because, right, I, I didn't, I probably get, I can speak, I think you probably can speak for you in this case too. I didn't go to acad academia to like exclusively get a degree. Like I wanted a, a fulfilling career. I wanted to develop skill sets. I wanted to develop myself and my thinking. Um, so it's important to remember that, um, Everyone has a different reason for being there. It's not just to publish papers. It's to become a better person in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and, and I feel that academia needs to, to, to move more in that direction. Um, and and, and there, there are a lot of problems associated with, with academia for as good as it is and as, as much of it, I think, it works well. Um, you know, as I said, a lot of it has to do with uh, the pressure and the difficulty of getting funding. Um, you know, and, and I empathize completely with how hard that is. But if you want to make getting funding easier, you advocate to policymakers, right? Mm -hmm. So by by focusing too too narrowly on what you want to accomplish, you know those people, the people writing grants, will complain about how hard it is to get a grant. It is hard, but but then simultaneously, maybe their student might come to them and say, "Hey, you know, I'd like to do some advocacy at the." The national level, you know, I'd like to go meet with some policymakers and their staff and talk to them about why we need more science funding. And and I would say at least some advisors and some programs would say, but your focus is your research. So then they close the door and then they complain about how hard it is to get grant funding. Well, that person could have gotten you grant funding, you know, maybe not in, in, in the immediate, but that's the groundwork that you have to lay to to get that. Um, so that's maybe maybe point number two is. Um, we need to kind of invest more time into payouts that come later, right? Long-term payout and not just sort of the immediate gratification of publishing a, a big paper, or getting a big grant. Um, so, there, you know, there, I could go on. I <laughs> This is something, as I said, I spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, I love, I, like I said, I love academia in a lot of ways, but I, I think those kind of, those points to me are the ones that um, become more frustrating where, um, for as high-minded as everybody is at those institutions, they can be really, they can think really narrowly about what their goals are and what everyone else's goals should be. Right, right. Wow, this has been such a good conversation, Chris. I really appreciate you um, taking us through it all and really also talking about things that obviously mean so much to you, like advocacy and, you know, looking into policy and you know, the ways in which academia, I also love academia very much so. I love college campuses. I, you know, there's something about a college campus that always, and seeing students walking around, that's always super exciting for me. But yeah. I agree that they, 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 I think the purpose of an educational institution definitely has changed. It's more, you know, and not to say capitalism is wrong, but it's definitely more capitalistic and, you know, we're looking for profits versus we're looking to create the next generation of thinkers. And, and that's, you know, right. in a lot of ways, that's really sad, but it's what it is. And we're hoping that, you know, as we continue, as people listen to stuff like this, that um, they will also begin to think about, okay, how can I contribute to the changing things? So this is such a great conversation, yeah. Chris. Yeah, thanks. No, I really appreciate you saying that. And also just uh, listening to me ramble. This is a nice <laughs> opportunity. I like having the opportunity to be in chain to just 
uh, talk uh, wildly. Uh, yeah, I, and, and just to, uh, for me that what you said, uh, you know, again, really resonates and, and it, it still to me comes back to that initial point that you made, which is just to be courageous and, and not have a lot of fear like that that goes for everything that we've we've talked about really um and being willing to put yourself a little bit on a limb also helps your experience while you're in the middle of it right being able to say you know what like i'm going to push back here a little bit you know you don't want to no one you shouldn't be a jerk ever um but but get comfortable with advocating for yourself also and and for following what's interesting to you and being willing to to do that both in the sense of like here's the thing i wrote like are you interested in publishing this to Hey, uh, you know, I know that it's really important to, you know, for my process to get this dissertation written, to publish these papers, et cetera. But I need to be doing this also because this is why I'm here. This is what, 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 you know, what, wakes, what gets me up in the morning. This is what I want to be doing for 50 years, not just the five to eight that I'm in grad school. Mm -hmm. So anyway, yeah, that to me is, uh, that's the thing I've been most uh, appreciative about talking about is just having the opportunity to encourage people to just, just let it fly. You know? Yeah, go for it. Go for it. All right. Thanks so much, Chris. This was such a great discussion. Yeah, thanks, G.